I want to start a little bit differently this morning. Um, I want to kind of, we've done two weeks. First week, deity and person of the Holy Spirit. Second week, a survey of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. So I want to hear from you guys and ask, there's, here's the test. What have you learned <laughs> over the last two weeks? Maybe something that you hadn't considered before. Maybe something that maybe you knew but was sharpened or clarified. What have you learned over the last two weeks? weeks. Just shout it out. What's that? I'm sorry? So the procession of the Spirit from the Father and the Son, that's what you're saying? Okay. Awesome. Inseparable operations? What does that mean? Yes, you nailed it. That was good. Yes, inseparable operations, right? Everything that we see in the Bible... <laughs> right? God operates as a triune Godhead, right? That's a simple way to say it, right? Everything that happens. So though there are two missions, which we talked about, mission one, where the Father sends the Son to accomplish salvation, and the mission two, the Father and the Son send the Spirit to apply salvation. Uh, The Trinity, all three persons are involved in that. Uh, They don't operate distinct from one another, um, though there are distinct missions, which can be confusing, but in separate operations. All right, what else? What have we learned? Ooh, the Son is eternally begotten. What does that mean? Yeah. Right. Yes. The Holy Spirit is not begotten. Begotten is, so that, that is connected to their personhood, which is unique. So the Spirit's personhood is unique from the Father and the Son, or of the Father and the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit's personhood is unique from the Son and the Father. Um, so only the Son is begotten. And then the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. Eternal procession, EP. Yeah. Other things that we've learned over the last two weeks. Yes, the Holy Spirit existed in the Old Testament, right? That can often be a question. And operated in much the same way, though in a different way, but not, there's both continuity and discontinuity, we should say, right, between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Other things? Yeah. Hmm. Right. Yes. Do you remember the Latin phrase for that? This is the, the test, the pop quiz. Filioque. Filioque, which means and the son. So in the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creedal Affirmation of AD 481 that we talked about, it, talks of, it says we believe in the Holy Spirit eternally proceeding from the Father and the Son. That phrase and the Son, filioque, was added later, um, but was an agreed upon thing in uh yeah i've thought a lot about this actually since week one that's probably been one of the main things that's been on my mind um and part of the reason why is because i've been continuing to ask myself okay why why does it matter why does it matter that we say the holy spirit proceeds from the father and the son so part of it for me I, think about, I was thinking about just in terms of ontology. Remember we talked about that word. It means like the study of self, the study of self-existence, I guess, like your nature. Um, 
in terms of personhood. Personhood is derived always in a descending fashion, which again, our words are, you know, they fail us here, they fall short, but let's say the son, for example, is, let's say that you're a father and you have a son. Is the, is the son a son because you are a father or are you a father because you have a son? What do you guys think? Yes. So it's kind of like a square is a rectangle, but a rectangle is not a square type of thing. Um, but in terms of the logical ordering, which one has to come first? Like in the sense of the father has to exist first before the personhood of the son, right? So in terms of logical ordering, it's descending. Does that make sense? Right? So the father determines the personhood of the son because the son is coming from the Father, which we would say in terms of the Trinity e- eternally generated from the Father. Now, if the, if the Holy Spirit came only from the Father in a descending fashion, let's say we had these two lines like this, in terms of personhood, right? So the Son receives his personhood, so to speak, from the Father, right? Because of the logical descending order of personhood. But if the Holy Spirit receives it in the same way, these two lines, in terms of substance, are the exact same thing. Does that make sense? Because we can't go in reverse. We can't say, well, the Holy Spirit is different from the Son. Therefore, this relationship is different because it it is a logically descending relationship, right? Like your kids don't determine the relationship with the, the Father. It's the other way around. Because one, logically speaking, in terms of ordering, comes first. So these become exactly the same thing, which is troublesome because we keep saying the word personhood and we keep saying specifically the phrase unique personhood. So there would be nothing unique about the way that the Holy Spirit receives his personhood from the Father if they receive it in the exact same way from the exact same person. So that's why you have this triangle where the son has a unique personhood because it's eternally generated from the father, which is E.G., right? So he's the only person in the Trinity that receives his personhood being generated by the father. So that's what makes it unique. The Holy Spirit, on the other hand, proceeds both from the father and the son. So this, the father and the son and the Holy Spirit proceeding gives him his unique personhood in contradistinction from the son. Am I making sense here? Does this make sense? Right? So like in my mind, I've been thinking a lot about this. I do think, and I believe this the whole time, but it just, as I continue to dwell on it more, right, in terms of personhood being derived logically in a descending fashion, right, the father eternally generates the son. That is a unique relationship, meaning that if he did the same thing with the spirit, there'd be nothing ontologically unique about it. So how could you distinguish them? So the Holy Spirit is the only person of the Trinity that eternally proceeds from the Father and the Son. So that, that way we can say the Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is not the Father. We can make those distinctions in personhood because of those eternal and internal relationships, right? Which those Latin phrases, ad intra, which is the relationships between the Trinity, and ad extra, which is the missions, the, the processions, the two processions, turned outward in time for the benefit of image bearers. Make sense? Do you have a question? Yeah. Okay. So there are a lot of, yeah, there are a lot of different ways of talking about the Spirit. In fact, even in Paul, in places like Galatians, 1 Corinthians, um, even Ephesians, uses the phrase spiritual. I could not address you as spiritual people. So we would believe, I would believe, that when Paul is using a phrase like, I can't address you as spiritual people, that comes from someone who is walking in the spirit right someone who is you know not gratifying the desires of the flesh but someone who is in a relationship with the spirit 
being empowered by the Spirit. So they are not spiritual as in their, their interaction with the Spirit is shallow, right? So like there's different ways of talking about the Spirit of God. There's more categories like that in the New Testament than in the Old Testament. So the Spirit of Christ would be, you know, a similar thing where it would be referring mostly to the Holy Spirit, right? It's not like, you know, Christ has a Spirit and the Holy Spirit is a different Spirit because um, that can kind of get into the nature-person distinction of Christ, which, you know, his human nature versus his personhood, his eternal personhood that he receives eternally generated from the Father. Um, and even like dichotomy and trichotomy, you know, are we three parts or two parts? Do we have a soul and a body or do we have a soul, a spirit, and a body? Which I believe we, in a dichotomy, which we don't have a soul, a spirit, and a body. We have a soul and a body. Uh, so anyways, all that to say, I think when it was referring to the spirit of Christ, it's the Holy Spirit, right, in most instances. Um, but yeah, that's a good question. Other things that we've learned, yeah. Mm. Right. Yeah. Yeah, this, the Holy Spirit is a person as expressed in his intellect, his knowledge, his emotion. He can be grieved, his will, right? He sovereignly distributes gifts to the church. First Corinthians uh, 12 would talk about that, even the body of Christ. Um, yeah, that's good. All right, well, I just wanted to do like a quick review. Part of it is just even for my own purposes as a teacher, making sure that what I'm saying is making sense. <laughs> that's everyone in the room, so that's good. Um, yeah, these are good things. So uh, just so that you understand kind of where we're going today, if you look at your note sheet, there is an overwhelming amount of scripture passages that are from a variety of different books in the New Testament. Uh, so realistically, there's just no way that we're going to be able to get through all of these today. Um, but I put them all there for you, even broke them down through all the, the different Gospels. Um, I put them all there for you again so that you can reference these in the weeks, months, years to come. If you were thinking about, okay, doing even a, a systematic study of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament, these would be a really good starting place for you in that sense. What I'm going to do today that's a little bit different, it's not in your notes in the same way, but I'll try to make it clear as we go along. I want to talk about three big categories of the Spirit in the New Testament, because what you'll see is in the New Testament, the Spirit, he almost drips from, from every page. I mean, he's, his work is so evident um, in a lot of different ways. And so to do a survey of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament, we're not going to be able to touch on every single thing, but I'll try to give you some, some big buckets. So the first one will be the life and ministry of Christ and the role of the Spirit um, in that, specifically expressed in the Gospels. Then we'll talk about the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts, which is that pivotal point in redemptive history where the Spirit ushers in a new age, uh, which is you know, referred to as the age of the Spirit, um, where the Spirit pours out at Pentecost and the, the establishment of the church kicks off. We'll talk about that. And then we'll specifically focus on Galatians, which is more about Paul saying to walk in the Spirit. Galatians is a smaller book, one of the smaller letters in the New Testament. Uh, so percentage-wise, the number of references to the Spirit in Galatians is pretty high comparatively to other books, um, and it's specifically about individuals walking in the Spirit. So three big categories, right? The life and ministry of Christ, the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, and then the Holy Spirit in the life of believers. And then we'll try to summarize the Holy Spirit as we see in the New Testament. But like I said, the Holy Spirit drips from every page of the New Testament, which would make sense because uh, he was promised and foretold he would rest on the Messiah, and then the Messiah and the Father would send him to apply salvation that was accomplished by Christ. Uh, so it would make sense that he's a part of uh, basically almost every aspect of our Christian life, most especially our salvation, which we will talk more specifics next week. But let's quickly review last week. We said the Holy Spirit, the, the word for spirit in the... Um, and the Hebrew was ruach, right, which can mean spirit, lowercase s, spirit, uppercase, breath, wind. There's approximately 100 references to the spirit of God or God's spirit in the Old Testament. We looked at many of those last week. Um, and really the summary of that, we talked about how the Holy Spirit uh, works primarily corporately with the nation of Israel, right? God calls Israel 
as his chosen people calls them, sets them apart from other nations uh, as a way of calling other people. So he calls them out to call other people out so that they could worship the one true God, that kind of idea. And he calls Israel, makes a covenant with Abraham specifically in Genesis 12, 15, 17, and 22 that promises land, seed, and blessing, uh, which ultimately we know even what we're talking about in the main service today, Genesis 3, 15, the serpent or the seed of the woman uh, would come and would crush the head of the serpent. So that's called the proto evangelion uh, the first gospel. Uh, and that's traced all the way through, you know, the line of David, the line, obviously, of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and specifically the nation of Israel and the Holy Spirit corporately works most especially with them. Uh, so we said the summary of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, he was involved in creation. Uh, he endowed specific individuals for office, right, such as judges, kings, prophets. We saw that in the book of Judges, especially, uh, and even Saul and David anointing them uh, for the office of king of, over Israel. Uh, then we said knowledge and insight, uh, which, you know, wisdom and discernment that were given uh, to individuals, even skills that we saw of specific individuals who were a part of uh, building the tabernacle. The Holy Spirit gave them unique skills in that process to help build the tabernacle, the dwelling place of the Lord. Uh, and then ultimately a source of prophecy, right? Where in Isaiah, especially uh, the spirit is prophesying about the future Messiah, but also there's a prophecy that the spirit would rest on the Messiah. And we'll see that from the New Testament perspective today, uh, but also judgment over Israel, right? Because of their rebellion and their rejection against the Lord. So a quick summary quote here. We had this last week, but the Old Testament has a preparatory nature to prepare for the outpouring of the Spirit upon all flesh. In the Old Testament, it is focused on the preservation of the covenant seed. That's what we're talking about. The seed of the woman that ultimately became a part of the covenant with Israel. Whereas in the New Testament, it is directed to the perfecting of the fruitage and the gathering of the harvest. The perfecting of those who... Uh, have been regenerated by the Spirit in the gathering of the harvest, uh, most especially in the last days that, w that are laid out in the book of Revelation. That does come from the book on the back of your note sheet, The Holy Spirit by Robert Lee Lethem. All right, so the Holy Spirit in the Gospels. So you'll notice on your note sheet it says the Holy Spirit in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We're not going to go through those individually because I just want to summarize all of that because most we, what we could say is in terms of the Spirit's role and activity throughout the Gospels, it's almost exclusively centered around the person and work of Jesus Christ. So I want to show you that, how the Spirit is involved. Um, and Amy was just even talking about there's, there's different theological debates, uh, you know, eternal subordination of the Son. There's different debates about the, the, the role of the Spirit in relation to the Son, in terms of his submission to the Spirit and submission to the Father. We're not going to get into all of that today, uh, just because it would kind of be a little bit in the weeds. But just so that you know, there are kind of debates about the role of the Spirit uh, between the, the Spirit and the Son and how they kind of interacted together. But I'll try to show you some of that as we uh, go along. So the Holy Spirit in uh, the Gospels and the life and ministry of Jesus. So before Jesus even enters the scene, the Spirit is preparing the way. You remember the story of um, the uh, John, right, the, the birth narrative of John, that he became the forerunner of Jesus, John the Baptist. We'll look at uh, Luke 1, 13 through 17. This is a birth narrative. There's uh, only, I think, three birth narratives in Scripture. One of them is uh, one of the judges, right? Is it Samuel? No, I think it's Samuel, and then John, and then Jesus. Anyone fact check me on that? But anyways, Luke 1, 13 through 17 talks about the Spirit's role in uh, bringing about John the Baptist, who would serve as a forerunner for Jesus. So it says, The angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John, John the Baptist. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy spirit even from his mother's womb and he will turn many of the children of israel to the lord their god and he will go before him before christ in the spirit and power of elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers 
uh, to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. So John the Baptist, he was baptizing people. You know the story uh, where he is serves as a forerunner. He was someone in the old days, uh, a, a royal herald was someone that would take good news, which is what the gospel means, by the way. Euangelion is not necessarily specific to Christianity. It just meant in, in the Bible, like good news. So someone who was a royal messenger that was sent by the king, he would bring the gospel which was not necessarily associated with Christ, he would bring the gospel, the good news about a victory that the king would have or uh, some sort of good news that the, that the kingdom needed to know, right? So a messenger, a royal messenger would be tasked by the king with a message, with good news. They would run throughout the, the towns and the streets telling everyone about the good news that came directly from the king. John the Baptist serves as a royal messenger for the coming king, Jesus. And we see the Spirit is involved in that. So before even Jesus, is, before his birth, before his conception by the Spirit and the Virgin Mary, we see the Spirit actively at work bringing about a forerunner. Now why is this important? Well, it's important because it connects the narrative of Jesus' birth in his life to the Old Testament. We looked at passages in Isaiah especially uh, that talk about this forerunner that would come. He would be like the prophet Elijah. He would come and basically he would point to the Messiah. And even John the Baptist says, someone greater than I is coming. So this is even before, again, Jesus is born, the Holy Spirit is at work to fulfill prophecy that happened long ago, right? Between the, the two Testaments, the Old Testament and the New Testament, it's called the intertestamental period. It was about 400 years of silence, you might say. There wasn't prophecy happening in the same way as we see uh, at the conclusion of the Old Testament. So this was hearkening back to Isaiah, right? Where he, it says there's going to be a forerunner, a, someone like Elijah, John the Baptist, the Spirit, makes that happen, fulfills the prophecy as a means of ushering in uh, the life and ministry of Jesus. Now, we also have the birth of Jesus and the Spirit being actively involved in that. That's also in Luke, which, by the way, just as a, a fun fact, the Gospel of Luke, out of all of the Gospels, is pr perhaps uh, the most Christologically dense. So it includes these things about the Spirit being involved in the birth of John the Baptist, the forerunner. It includes the Spirit obviously involved in um, the birth of Christ and basically all the activities of Christ. It's perhaps the most densely packed uh, pneumatological book, pneumatology, the, the Greek word pneuma, right, pneuma, uh, means spirit. So uh, just for that, so that you know that. Okay, so in Luke 1, 26, it says, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, that's where Jesus was born, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Now, it's significant that Mary is a virgin. I'll just say quickly on that, she was a virgin, and part of the significance of that was that she did not pass down a sin nature to Jesus, right? Jesus' father was not earthly, we inherit our sin nature from our earthly father, Adam. Jesus' father was not Adam, right? It was, uh, you know, he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. So there's significance in that. So the virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you, or the Lord bless you, or some translations say you are full of grace. Mary, full of grace, some people would say. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, again connecting him to the covenants made with Israel. He came from the line of David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. So again, Jesus, before he's born, we have the Spirit actively at work, fulfilling prophecy, 
helping John the Baptist come on the scene as a royal messenger, a forerunner pointing to Christ, someone greater is coming. Then we've got the Holy Spirit actively involved in the birth of Christ, which again is significant because he is conceived in a divine way, uh, which he can maintain his nature-person distinction, right? So he assumes humanity, but he maintains his deity, right? So Jesus, uh, the eternal son, he does not lose parts of himself, he adds to himself. That's significant, right? He adds to himself flesh, but he maintains his eternal personhood of the son. But as, as he assumes the flesh, because he's born of a virgin conceived by the spirit he does not inherit a sinful corrupt nature uh, like you and i would so the spirit all right involved in the forerunner uh, john the baptist pointing to christ involved in the birth of christ he was also involved in the baptism of christ this is a significant uh, pneumatological moment as well in the gospels in the gospel of luke uh, it says now when all the people were baptized by john the baptized uh, john the baptist which by the way uh, in the Greek, it just like John the Baptizer. So it was, his name wasn't Baptist. <laughs> it was sort of like a moniker given to him because he was baptizing people. John the Baptizer. Right? And when all the people were baptized by John, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. Now, this is a significant moment for Jesus because, again, this comes on the heels of this forerunner, which was prophesied and fulfilled by the Spirit. This comes after the virgin, obviously, conception of Jesus and birth of Jesus, which was empowered by the Spirit. Now, there's a baptism. Obviously, Jesus, at this point, is an adult. He's being baptized by John the Baptist, and this is the launch of the ministry of Jesus. So when Jesus gets baptized, this signifies a shift, Right, where we don't really have much information besides Luke tells us he grew in wisdom and stature. Beyond that, we don't really know a, a ton about what he did as a kid or the things that he did as a teenager or even as a, a young adult. We don't, we don't know. But we do know is there's a shift that happens when he gets baptized and the Holy Spirit descends on him. And the implication is that the Holy Spirit is empowering Jesus to do the task that the Father sent him to do. So the Holy Spirit comes on him. And really this serves, I've talked about this before, even in the main service or in Plants and Pillars, but this serves as a royal commissioning ceremony, right? Where it talks about, you are my beloved son, with you I'm well pe- pleased. The father saying to the son, I am affirming you as the Messiah. I am affirming you uh, as the true king of Israel and the king of the world uh, that has come, that was prophesied about, you are my beloved son, with you I'm well pleased. It's a commissioning ceremony where the spirit rests on Jesus. And it basically in the gospels, both Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, John doesn't have this specific instance, but in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, they are signifying, okay, this is Jesus being commissioned for the task that he was sent to accomplish, which we know, right, is a temporal mission which is an eternal relation within the Trinity turned outside of itself in time for the benefit of us, right? So an eternal relation between the Father and the Son. Now we see the mission on full display. Again, the Holy Spirit descends on him, rests on him like a dove. And the implication, again, he's being empowered by the Spirit to accomplish the work that the Father set before him. So we have the forerunner before he's even born. We have the Holy Spirit involved in his birth uh, through the Virgin Mary, the conception there. We've got the baptism of Jesus, which is the pivotal moment, a uh, commissioning ceremony where God affirms, this is my beloved son. I am pleased with you. Basically, God is saying, do what I've told you to do. Yeah. Right. That's a great question. So it goes back to inseparable operations, 
right? Where the Trinity never operates outside of itself, even though in Scripture we see different persons of the Trinity highlighted. Um, salvation is, is deeply Trinitarian, right? So everything, at creation is Trinitarian. Uh, Paul talks about in Colossians 1 uh, or John chapter 1 uh, that all things were created through Jesus, uh, but it also talks about in Genesis chapter 1 that the Spirit uh, was there at creation, hovering over the waters. We obviously know that the Father was involved in creation, so it's Trinitarian in that sense. Um, so Jesus as, you know, a boy, uh, what role did the Spirit have in, you know, enabling him? Um, I don't know. We don't, we don't see that. I do know the doctrine of inseparable operations is at play there, meaning he's always uh, connected, so to speak, to the Father and the Spirit. He's never, like, disconnected, maybe except for the cross. Um, but your question kind of goes to the hypostatic union, which is basically like how does his uh, human nature interact with his divine nature? And, you know, how does one relate to the other? Because we believe he's fully God and fully man. Um, I do believe scripture says like it was not possible for Jesus to sin. Part of the reason why I get there is uh, his immutability. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus and all of the members of the Trinity, they're unchanging. Uh, and so, you know, to, to say that there was a possibility that the eternal Son of God could even conceive of doing something sinful, to me, just as far outside the bounds of Scripture. Um, but in terms of the role of the Spirit, specifically in his earlier years, I'm not sure. But I think what we're seeing the gospel writers do, and even God sovereignly and providentially, is he's signifying there's a shift happening in terms of uh, a covenant people, right? Where the covenant people of Israel obviously are, are made much of in the Old Testament. Now there's a, a new covenant that's being dawned. It's called the age of the eschaton, uh, the age of the spirit, which is coming. Uh, but this is signifying, okay, there is the Messiah, the one that we've been waiting for, and he is being empowered by the spirit as prophesied in the Old Testament. So um, I don't think it was like the spirit was absent in his, early, in his earlier days. Um, and again, I don't know the specifics about how all that worked, but I do think this is almost saying, okay, this is fulfillment of prophecy, um, and it's like affirming Jesus as the true Messiah, the anointed one, the, the king. Um, yeah, does that make sense? So a lot of unanswered questions there because we don't have a lot about what he did. You know, we know about him running away to the temple uh, but outside of that, you know, we don't have much of what he did as a kid. Um, we do know that in the Gospels, in the Gospel of Mark, for instance, Jesus and his family, um, when he is in Capernaum, which is about 20 miles uh, northeast of Nazareth, when he's in Capernaum doing ministry, his family comes, tracks him down, and basically says he's lost his mind. So we know that his family, especially early on, did not view him as the Messiah. And then actually Jesus in Mark chapter 6 goes back to Nazareth, southwest of Capernaum. And the people in Capernaum, or the people in uh, Nazareth, now he's done all of these miracles, he's done all these things. They're like, who is this guy? Isn't he the carpenter? Um, and then that's when Jesus says, you know, a prophet is not without honor except for in his hometown. So uh, Jesus, and I was thinking about that this week because I was like, okay, this kid that was perfect, never sinned, did someone, did no one say like, there's something unique about this kid? Um, but apparently, whatever, their spiritual blindness, Jesus comes back to his hometown, small town, by the way. Uh, he was a carpenter there, which means he was probably pivotal to the, uh, the economy of that small town, uh, constructing things well known. Uh, and they were all like, what's this guy doing? He's kind of lost his mind. So his family says, you've lost your mind. Uh, his whole town basically says that you've lost your mind. Uh, so even though he was perfect and sinless, um, we see just a rejection of him. I'm um, not sure what that has to do with the spirit, but it was on my mind. So uh, there we go. So forerunner, uh, birth of Christ, baptism of Christ. Then we immediately, interestingly enough, see the spirit driving out Jesus uh, into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. This is, happens exactly uh, after his baptism. And Jesus full of the Holy Spirit. So now, again, the implication being he's, he's, the Spirit has come and rested on him as prophesied uh, in the book of Isaiah, in the book of Joel. Uh, it has happened. He's full of the Holy Spirit, empowered for the ministry ahead, returned from the Jordan, and was led 
by the Spirit in the wilderness. Now that's interesting. Uh, there's a lot of um, Exodus themes here. We don't have time to go into all of that. Uh, but basically, the Exodus was a pivotal moment in Israel's history. Obviously, when God rescued them from slavery, um, this kind of parallels that in some way, where Jesus now, he's out in the wilderness, right? And there's this uh, sort of battling that's going on between him and Satan. Um, but the Spirit empowers Jesus uh, to overcome temptation. And it's kind of a foreshadowing early on of what's going to happen on the cross. Right? So like, there's this battle between good and evil. Jesus, being led by the Spirit, goes into the wilderness. Satan tempts him. We, we know Jesus quotes Scripture at him. Jesus says, you know, look at all of these kingdoms. They can have them, or you can have them. They can be yours, which is fascinating to think about. It's like offering, um, I don't know. I don't know. There's no example. Offering someone that has everything, something that they don't need, um, but, but they already have. So interesting enough. So the Holy Spirit, right? leads Jesus out into the wilderness uh, and to be tempted. There's this sort of battling where Jesus conquers Satan, uh, conquers uh, temptation, again, as a foreshadowing of what would ultimately come on the cross where he conquers sin and death once and for all, right? So that happens early on at the beginning of Jesus's ministry. So the forerunner, John the Baptist, the birth of Christ, the coming of Christ, uh, the baptism of Christ, the commissioning of Christ, uh, and then Jesus is being tempted uh, then we also see the ministry message and miracles of Christ being, again, empowered by the Spirit. Luke 4.14, Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. Now, why is that a significant verse? Because, again, this sh marks a shift where Jesus just has gone out. He's done, quote-unquote, battle against Satan in the wilderness. He's conquered temptation. There's, again, themes connected there to the Exodus event. Now there's a, a new Exodus that is coming where Jesus is going to rescue his people uh, from slavery to sin. Uh, and he's kind of the first person to, to, to do that, especially against Satan. Now he returns to Galilee where he begins his ministry, and he, he does that in the power of the Spirit. And a report about him went out through all the surrounding country. So Jesus' ministry, his message, and his miracles were empowered by the Spirit. Now, one of the reasons why we can say that from Scripture is actually uh, from Mark 3, 22 through 30. Have you guys ever heard of the, the unforgivable sin, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? Has that ever kept you up at night before? Have you committed the unforgivable sin? Uh, this is part of the reason why we believe, and you can kind of build out a theology of the Holy Spirit empowering Jesus to do especially his, his miracles, his, his miraculous works in the New Testament. So let's just read it together. Mark 3, uh, verse 22 says, And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is, Jesus, possessed by Beelzebul, and by the prince of demons he, he cast out the demons. So there's an accusation where basically they're saying Jesus is doing these miraculous things because he's being empowered by Satan. Now, you'll, you'll see there's an implicit uh, confession that what Jesus is doing is, in fact, miraculous, that it's not normal, that normal humans, unless they had some sort of outside force or power helping them, such as Beelzebul, the prince of demons, uh, they wouldn't be able to do what Jesus does. So implicit in this is people acknowledging, yes, Jesus is doing things that he should not be able to do. But they're trying in their minds to make sense of it. They're not going to confess that he's the Messiah. So they're going to assign the works that he's doing to Satan. That's what's going on. And he called them to him and said to them in parables, how can Satan cast out Satan? Obviously, he's doing a logical argument, basically, where he's kind of pointing out the absurdity of what they're saying. If I am empowered by Satan, but the things that I'm doing are counteracting the works of Satan, which was, you know, freeing people from demonic possession, healing people from uh, disease and sickness. Uh, so he's, he's undoing the work of Satan. So Jesus' argument here is, how can Satan cast out Satan? I'm empowered by Satan, but I'm over here undoing the works of Satan. So Satan, if I'm empowered by Satan, is just the fool of fools because he's helping me Work against him, basically, is Jesus' argument. If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to 
an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods, Satan being the strong man, unless he first binds the strong man, then indeed he may plunder his house. Now, well, where is the spirit in all this? Well, here we go. Verse 28. Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. Now, wait a second. We just read that they're accusing Jesus of being empowered by Satan. So Jesus is the one being accused by these individuals of being empowered by Satan, of being demonic in some sense. But Jesus says in accusing him of of being empowered by Satan, who are they blaspheming? The Holy Spirit. So if Jesus is the one being accused of being empowered by Satan, how is it that they are blaspheming the Holy Spirit? Well, it's because the things that Jesus was doing that they implicitly are acknowledging are, in fact, miraculous. Jesus himself says they are empowered by the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So when they accuse Jesus of being empowered by Beelzebul, in fact, they are committing blasphemy against the Holy Spirit because he is the one involved in these miraculous works. The Spirit has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin, for they are saying he has an unclean spirit. So we can say that the ministry of the Spirit is involved in the, uh, the, the miracles of Jesus and the mighty works of Jesus. Jesus himself makes mention of that in this kind of dramatic text. Um, and so that is important for us to understand, right? The Spirit is involved in every aspect of the person and work of Jesus Christ, from the forerunner coming to his birth, to his baptism, to his temptation, his miracles, even up into his resurrection, when Jesus completes salvation. That's Romans 8, 11. It says, if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you he who raised christ jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you so the spirit is not only involved in the life and ministry of jesus he's also involved in the resurrection of jesus so we can see right just as just kind of a, an overview we can see in the gospels matthew mark luke and john that jesus is empowered by the spirit that falls on him as prophesied fulfilling prophecy signifying he truly is the Messiah, who empowers him, enables him uh, to do miraculous works, and that even helps in the process of raising him from the, the dead. Uh, so let's quickly just go through some passages here uh, in the Gospel of John that are unique, that kind of talk about the Holy Spirit in the Gospel of John. The first one, John fourteen twenty six. We read this, I think, week one. But John says, or Jesus says, the Helper, the Holy Spirit, remember that Greek word, parakletos, paraclete, which is another name for spirit, the paraclete, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. So this even is an extension of the role of the Spirit in the life and ministry of Jesus, because he's with Jesus, empowering Jesus on Jesus, you know, enabling these divine works, all of those different things. And even Jesus says, when I leave, the Spirit's going to come and he's going to continue to teach you the things that I have taught you. He's going to continue to bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Again, pointing back to Christ. John 15, 26. But when the helper, the paraclete comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. So even the the role of the Spirit, again, is to point back to Christ, to lead us into the truth of Christ, to bear witness in our hearts and in our in our our souls about the truthfulness of Christ, about who he is. One final verse in John, John 16, 13, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. So the spirit, again, involved in the life and ministry of Jesus from the opening verses of Matthew uh, to the ascension that we see in the book of Acts, right? The Spirit of God uh, involved intricately uh, in the the life and ministry of Jesus. Now let's quickly run run through the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. We'll start with uh, Acts 1, 4, and 5. This is when Jesus uh, is again reminding his disciples that the Spirit is coming. 
that the Spirit will be sent. Acts 1, 4, and 5 says, And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me. For John baptized with water, John the baptizer, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So we see Jesus, again, pointing to the reality that the Spirit's going to come. He's going to fall on the day of Pentecost, and he's going to usher in uh, a new uh, salvation epic, we could say. He's going to usher in a a new reality, which is the the age of the church or the age of the Spirit. Acts 1.8, but you will receive, when the Spirit comes, he's talking to his disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So the Spirit's going to come. It's going to mark a new age in the life of those who worship God. And when he comes, he's going to empower people to do the work of ministry that Jesus has been doing the whole time he was on earth. So they're going to continue the ministry of Jesus, but they're going to be similarly to Jesus, but in a unique way, empowered by the Holy Spirit. He's going to come in an unprecedented way uh, to help with empowering individuals for ministry. Acts 2-4, this is when that moment happens. So Jesus says, hey, stay here. Not many days from now, this is going to happen. The Spirit's going to come. And it says, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, just as was promised, and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, I know some of you have got questions about that. We will answer them in a few weeks when we talk about spiritual gifts and the miraculous gifts and what role, if any, that they play today. But for now, we just need to understand that the Spirit came as he was prophesied in the Old Testament. We read some of those prophecies last week. And he fell, and and the people, uh, as evidence of that, began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Another passage, Acts 2, 14 through 18, kind of points our uh, attention to the fulfillment of prophecy that we've been saying. In the last days, as Joel talks about, God will pour out his spirit. We read that last week. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For this, these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. That is hilarious. Uh, but this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Again, another fulfillment of prophecy. That's Joel uh, 2, 28 through 29, which is one of the, the, the passages that we read last week. So that was prophesied. The Spirit's going to pour out in the day of Pentecost. The Spirit does just that. Acts 2, 33 says, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, talking about Jesus, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. So again, another even fulfillment of the words of Jesus when he says, when I leave, I'm going to send the Spirit. The Father is going to send the Spirit. Together, the Father and the Son send the Spirit. And now it has happened. Being therefore exalted. Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father. That is the the position of authority, right? He has had victory. He has secured uh, salvation. He has accomplished all of the things that the Father set him out to accomplish. Therefore, now he's exalted at the right hand of God, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. He has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. Uh, One more, I think, in Acts, just to get us an idea of what happens uh, with the the Spirit in the book of Acts. Acts 13, 2 through 4 says, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. Now, I just put that passage in there to kind of show the role of the Holy Spirit in enabling individuals for ministry tasks, for setting aside individuals for ministry tasks, and ultimately uh, being intricately involved in the establishment of the early church, which again was kind of marked 
uh, by the day of Pentecost where the Spirit comes. And now the Holy Spirit is involved in setting apart people, giving them gifts, enabling them for ministry, and empowering them to accomplish that ministry. That's a kind of a gross summary of what you'll find of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. Now, for sake of time, we'll just quickly go over the Holy Spirit in Galatians. So remember, we've got those three big buckets that we talked about. The role of the Spirit in the life and ministry of Christ. Uh, the role of the Spirit in the book of Acts, the coming, the outpouring of the Spirit in an unprecedented way that was prophesied in Joel. Jesus and the Father, they send the Spirit, and now the Spirit is at work building the church, enabling people, empowering people, leading people uh, to do specific ministry tasks for the good of the church. Now, this one is perhaps more personal. Those uh, that, that center one about the church is more corporate. Uh, this is more individual where Paul talks often of the spirit in the book of Galatians. Galatians 4, 6 basically talks about because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So there's a sense in which, you know, if you ask the question, how do we know if we truly are saved? How do we know that? Well, part of the, the confidence that we have, part of uh, the, ass the assurance that we can have comes from the Spirit of God, which leads us to say, Abba, Father. So to understand, basically, that we truly are sons or daughters of God. That's part of the role of the Spirit in the life of an individual believer. Galatians 5 uh, says, For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. So not only does the Holy Spirit give us a sense of confidence in our hearts that we truly are children of God. He also helps us by, by faith to eagerly await the hope of righteousness, which is the future reality of our salvation. Because we live in this reality where Jesus has accomplished salvation, the Spirit is applying salvation, and yet there's a future reality of salvation that has not yet come when Jesus returns. John talks about this in 1 John chapter 3. And he says, on that day, you will be like him, for you will see him as he is. That's a future reality. It says, through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly await the hope of righteousness. And the Spirit is involved uh, in that. Uh, Galatians 5, 16 through 18, famous passage that talks about walking in the Spirit. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. If you don't want to be ruled by sin, you should be ruled by the Spirit. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So in the life of the individual believer, how do we grow? How do we have success in our sanctification, in our pursuit of holiness? Well, Paul tells us we walk in the Spirit. And that makes sense, right, with our temporal missions that we've talked about, because the Holy Spirit, as he is sent by the Father and the Son, what's his mission? To apply the salvation that was accomplished by the Son. So in applying salvation to our hearts in an ongoing way, not only do we cry, Abba, Father, because we have a sense of we are children of God, not only do we have a confidence and a, and, a, and a hopeful expectation of the future, we also, in the here and now, we are being grown and sanctified by walking in the Spirit so that we do not gratify the desires of the flesh. That's the role of the Spirit. Also a famous passage. Yeah. The, the Word and the Spirit work in tandem with one another. So you can't separate the work of the Word from the work of the Spirit. So the, the Word, think about it as like a, a hammer and a chisel right? The, the Word is the instrument that God has sovereignly chosen uh, to be utilized by the Spirit to chisel away, so to speak, the, the parts of our hearts that are uh, still uh, desiring the flesh, right? So you can't separate the, the work of the Word and the Spirit. And we'll talk more about that in the final week uh, when we focus all on what does it actually mean to walk in the Spirit and how do we do that? Basically, what, what, how do we know if we're walking in the Spirit and what things do we need to kind of be aware of in that respect. Um, fruit of the Spirit here, evidence of salvation. So we talked about the Spirit gives us confidence that we are children of God, gives us an expectant hope of what will come, helps us in the here and now. And part of the here and now is that we become different people, people right? 2 Corinthians 5, 17, we are new creations, different people that produce different fruit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, 
there is no law. So as evidence of the Spirit's work in your life, you will produce fruit if you're walking in the Spirit. And one final from Galatians 6, 8. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. So even that idea of kind of the compounding efforts of if you continue to indulge in the flesh, you will continue to be corrupted in the flesh. But if you walk in the Spirit, you will reap uh, eternal life, not even in an ultimate sense in the future, but eternal life biblically starts when you are saved. So we experience eternal life now in a different way, but it's, it's often referred to as the already, not yet. So we're already experiencing eternal life, which is kind of what we're talking about, reaping the benefits of eternal life, which would be most especially evident uh, by the fruit of the Spirit. So there's a lot of books that we didn't cover for the Second Thessalonians, the Corinthians, which obviously talk a lot about the spiritual gifts. We'll talk about that more in a few weeks. Uh, the book of Romans, the book of Ephesians. Um, so all of those are there for you to be able to just, again, uh, work through on your own time. Um, but I want to kind of give you a biblical theological summary of the Holy Spirit as we've seen it uh, in Scripture. Because basically what we've done is look at the whole of Scripture and we've tried to develop a biblical theology. What do we see of the Spirit, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament? And these are broad uh, buckets that kind of give us an idea of um, what he does. So the first thing is that he mediates God's uh, presence. He mediates God's presence. Even think about the Great Commission in Matthew uh, 28 when Jesus says, I will be with you always. So how can Jesus say, I will be with you, and then he leaves? How can he be with us? through the Spirit, right? Which is another instance of inseparable operations. When Jesus says, I will be with you, though he physically leaves, sits at the right hand of the Father, sends the Spirit, that's the idea of the presence of God actively in our lives. We saw that both in the Old Testament, uh, maybe in, especially in the tabernacle, uh, but also the Spirit falling on specific individuals, uh, being corporately involved, being with the nation of Israel, mediates God's presence. He also uh, imparts life, both in the original sense in the book of Genesis and in an ongoing sense, both physically, right? We're just humans in general are given life by the Spirit, and we are given new life by the Spirit. Jesus talks about in John 3, uh, about being born again of water and the Spirit. So us, uh, new life in Christ, the Spirit of God is revolved is involved in that. The Spirit also reveals truth, both in the Old Testament in a prophetic sense, right, where the prophets are declaring truth, most especially to the nation of Israel, uh, but also uh, in the um, in the, the New Testament, right, revealing truth, the, the doctrine of illumination, uh, where the Spirit helps us to understand spiritual truths, which we're even talking about tonight at Plants and Pillars, the idea of spiritual blindness, uh, where something as something so simple from a spiritual perspective can mean nothing to someone who doesn't have the spirit helping them to understand the truth of uh, the word. So it mediates God's presence. He imparts life. He reveals truth. Uh, he fosters holiness. That's what we just looked at in the book of Galatians. Uh, do not gratify the desires of the flesh, rather walk in uh, the spirit. Uh, he supplies power. We saw that especially in the book of Acts uh, to accomplish ministry tasks. So the things that you need, the power, so to speak, that you need for self-control, for putting to death your sin, uh, for growing in Christ's likeness, the Spirit supplies that. And he also uh, affects unity, unity between the Jews and the Gentiles, that's Ephesians 2, but also within the church, right? Ephesians 2, Paul talks about he has removed the dividing wall of hostility between the Gentiles and the Jews, the Spirit of God at work there, uh, but also bringing unity within the context of a local church. So from a biblical theological perspective, overall, the Spirit of God mediates God's presence. It's God's presence with us. He imparts life, especially new life, being born again. He reveals truth, most especially through His Word. He fosters holiness and growth. He supplies the power for the things that we need ministry-wise and in our personal lives, and he affects unity so that we are unified, as Paul says in Ephesians 4, one faith, one Lord, one spirit, one baptism. The spirit brings about all of that. Uh, well, we are out of time for today. It is 10.15. Um, let me pray for us, and then we will conclude our time together. Father, thank you for uh, 
uh, your word. Thank you for all of the things that we've been, been able to observe of the Spirit, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And Father, I just pray that we would continue to just be uh, really clear on who you are and that we would, as John says, we would worship in spirit and in truth. So help us just to continue to worship you and love you in deeper ways in Jesus' name. Amen.